Happy New Year, Animorphs fans. Firstly, sorry if I look a bit scruffy. I do need a haircut and a bit of a trim around here. That's point one done. Point two, we have started on the Animorphs Discord an Animorphs Fitness Club. We're going to work together as Annie fans and get ourselves fit throughout 2021 with a variety of workouts posted that you can do on your own, but we're also going to be doing group gym classes. So if you want to get fit this year and you want to do it with your fellow Animorphs fans, pop on over to the Animorphs Discord. The link is down below. Come join us and get fit for 2021. Right, so what are we doing in this video? We're looking at this book here, number 14, The Unknown. Now, before I started reading this book, there are a few other people that have recently read this book on the Animorphs Discord and they said that they were rather disappointed, especially coming off the back of something like book 13, for example one of the best books in the series. So I went into this with a little bit of uh, trepidation because I did not think that I was gonna be in for a thrill ride. Was I wrong? Let's get into it. Firstly, the books usually start with these side missions that are completely pointless and unnecessary. This one doesn't, which is a pleasant surprise, but in a way, it's sort of antithetical to the message of the story, which is weird, but we're going to get into the message of this story. So we start with Cassie's dad saying, right, there, there's a horse out that way, and it, it's, it's in a bit of bother. So Rachel's there with Cassie, and all three of those go off to find this horse. And it's near a military base, out in what's called the Dry Lands, which always reminds me of the Marillion song, but whatever. They find this horse and it's sort of swaying back, back and forth, goes up to a phone thing. They correctly assume that it was bitten by a snake, hence why it's all starting to go a bit woozy. And then it collapses somewhere. Rachel and Cassie go to investigate, look at this horse, and to their utter amazement, they find a yerk slug coming out of the ear. Now, apparently they think, oh, we could have mistaken it for a snake, but I don't understand how you mistake a slug for a snake. But I don't know, maybe these, maybe the yerks are actually like really long slugs, but who, who knows? The, uh, the horse is blown up by what they assume to be a dracon beam, correctly assume. But we, again, they think maybe we just imagined it, you know, we're going a bit mad. The first point of contention that I have with this book is a line on page 18 that Cassie's father says after this explosion which destroyed the horse. There's no trace left of it, so obviously Drake on beam. My father rolled his eyes. We're on the edge of an Air Force facility. They have a base way back in the drylands. You see the jets flying over all the time. I suspect that they may have lost a bomb or a missile or something. That snake-bitten horse must have set it off. The blast caught you. That sounds logical, Cassie says. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Military bases don't just lose bombs and missiles out in the middle of nowhere. They don't. Sorry. Maybe after, like, wars have happened, like if there's a territory where there was a war going on and my, uh, landmines are left. Yeah, understandable. But a desert in the middle of California with a base nearby... No, 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 no. That's not logical, no, no. One other thing that struck me, let's put this book up back here, by the way, so you can see it in all its horsey glory. One other thing that struck me uh, at this point of the story is this yerk has crawled out of the ear and another horse comes along, looks at it. The yerk, according to the story, is sort of like stretching up as if, I thought yerks were blind, but apparently this yerk can see this horse. Pff. I think it was the, the officer just trying to get some sort of point across, but you know. If a yerk's blind, it's not going to see the fucking horse. Maybe it heard the <coughs> stomping of the hooves. I don't fucking know. It reaches up and the horse is just like, nah, you're on your own. Fucked off. And then bang, gone. <laughs> you know, in militaries here, that usually, you know, if it's, if it's a, an advanced civilization's military, and even primitive militaries probably, they tend to care for their fallen soldiers. I saw a movie recently called Hacksaw Ridge, where this, uh, what you can only describe as a hero, stayed up on top of Hacksaw Ridge and just continually fed down injured soldiers to rescue them, no matter how little hope they may have looked to have had. That's a badly worded sentence. But the Yerks apparently don't do this, you know. This Yerk is still perfectly alive. The horse only has to really let the slug crawl onto it and then trot off. 
And no, they just think, oh, fuck it, bang. <laughs> Gone. Bye. Murder. Oh, the, the, the Yerks are dicks. Let's, let's face it. The Yerks are the classic example of a dick. I suppose that's all we can say about it, really. So, of course, the Animorphs think, well, this is all very strange. We have these horses and they're talking down phones and they explode and it looks like there's a Dracon beam and Cassie and Rachel swear that they saw a slug. So, obviously, they're not just going to let it drop. They want to investigate it. And then we get to chapter five, which is nothing, which is absolutely nothing. And chapter five, yes, pointless, but when we get to the end of the story, somehow it becomes relevant. It does. The chapter five is Rachel has given Cassie new clothes and she's sort of strutting around, you know, the, the hallways and saying, oh, look at how damn fine I am. And all the other people are starting to notice her. And of course, they're calling her the wrong names. And then they go into a classroom and Marco does his typical tease. And that's the chapter. And it's done. And you, you get through most of the book and you think, well, what was the point of that chapter? It's just completely pointless. A waste of pages. Hold your horses. Yes, pun intended. Wait till we get to the end of this and we'll jump back to chapter five. Let's carry on. Members of the animals fly out to Zone 91, which, of course, is a play on Area 51. I don't think I even needed to explain that to you. Jake doesn't go and Axe doesn't go, which I thought was strange. I mean, Jake's the leader. If he's going to send four of his people off, he might want to go see them, even if it's just to observe from a distance. But no, Jake just... Apparently he's got homework or something. I don't know. But the, the other four go off and they go into zone 91 and hide behind a cluster of rocks and demorph. So the three of them are now there barefoot because they still can't morph shoes and in really crappy fitness clothing essentially and Tobias is there. And then they get ambushed by military personnel and I was shocked and stunned because we Tobias is always saying how great his hearing is and how great his sight is. Even if he couldn't see these soldiers over a boulder, he's got the ears to pick them up. Look at what military personnel wear. Webbing, which is like these massive belts with things jangling on them, water bottles, uh, ammunition, rations. They've got big clunky boots, they've got helmets, they've got weapons. Tobias, how the fuck did you not hear them coming? I mean, seriously, what is your job? We talked in the last book about, oh, everyone has their roles. Do your fucking role properly. I mean, Jesus Christ. Why isn't he still up in the air? Why is he settling down here just being completely oblivious to his own hearing? Stay up there. They're in a military base and they could be ambushed at any point. Stay up there. Do your job. That's what Jake, that's why Jake needed to be there, to say to Tobias, right, you go up there. Because for all of Jake's problems in this book, he does the delegation thing when he needs to. He just wasn't around to do it here. So Tobias, you fail. Now, I will say that I love the fact that we're getting some military personnel on this because I, I love it. I, the military stuff, love it. And I know it's going to happen a few times in Animorphs and... I imagine those are going to be some of my favourite books. And it's partly why I like this one, because we, um, we get the military personnel. And I don't know, there's, it's just the ambience of it. But if that even makes sense. But Marco says something completely stupid. Completely and utterly stupid. So they're taken by these military personnel who are sort of like, well, why the hell are you here? Why haven't you got shoes? How the hell did you get here? So they go to this guy called Captain Torelli who is one of the head honchos at this base. I'd have thought there'd be someone of a higher rank than the captain at Area 51 or Zone 91, but apparently Captain Torelli is uh, one of the head honchos of security, so pff, whatever. So they get taken into his office, and he's sort of sitting there questioning him, like, why are you here? You realise that you're in a lot of shit because you've trespassed onto a high-security military base. And Marco decides to open his face hole and say... It was the Martians, well, he would say Lieutenant, I say Lieutenant, but we'll go for American. It was the Martians, Lieutenant. We were dropped here by aliens. Now, Marco, 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 you don't know if this guy is a yerk or not. 
or if anybody else in this base is a yerk or not. Because even if Captain Torelli isn't a yerk, he's going to step out of that room and he might say to somebody, oh, they just said some stuff about being dropped off by aliens. If any of these soldiers, these military personnel are yerks, they're going to think, we need to infest this kid just in case. Any competent yerk is going to think that. They're not just going to think, oh, they, they're probably just talking crap. They're going to say, what if something actually happened with our forces? We need to get this guy just in case to keep him silent. Marco, do not mention aliens in this situation, you fucking numbskull. Seriously. And he comes up with an excuse on page 69 that he says to Rachel and Cassie. Let's, uh, let's have a look at that. Actually, Marco said, with, a tra with no trace of his usual attitude, he would not have let us go till he contacted our parents. And we couldn't have that, could we? So I deliberately provoked him because now he'll just write us off as another bunch of deluded wackos. If we had seemed perfectly sensible, he'd really wonder what we were doing there with no shoes. Rachel glared at him suspiciously, but I knew Marco was right. Like I said, Marco's a clown sometimes, but he's not dumb. Yes, he fucking is dumb. You don't let him off the hook with that shit. Yeah, you're in a bad situation, but that was your own fault to begin with. Don't make it fucking worse by taking that risk. And as we'll find out, this book is full of a lot of stupid risks. And that was the second one, I think. Yeah, we'll say, we'll say that. <laughs> that's the second one. Marco could have just completely destroyed the Animorphs with that. Captain Torelli or any of the other soldiers there heard that. They said, right, that kid talked about aliens. We know who he is. We've seen his face. We're going to get him. Resistance, over. The only reason it would be considered smart if Marco knew that the horses were going in there because there were no yurks in the base and the horses were trying to get in via the horses. But he didn't know that at that point. He had no suspicion of that because it's after this part where we see the horses doing the, thing, doing the weirder things. So no, he's not being smart. He's being fucking stupid. That's just it. The Anwals then have a meeting in Cassie's barn. I believe it was Cassie's barn. And the character interactions here are delicious. Delicious, delicious, delicious. I think it's the same with the last book. When they, recently, when they've been in the Cassie's Barn scenes, they just bounce off each other so well. And Axe is my favourite here because he's done it before where he's just asking these oblivious questions in the background and everyone's just ignoring him. But not only that, but we do get his, uh, his arrogance playing through as well. And it's really out, out there in this book. He's, act, he's a bit of a dick in this book. He's saying like, <laughs> primitive human technologies, what use could Yerks do with that? Or that's something he said later on, but various times during the course of this book, he says something that's just completely dickish. And the other characters, even they are, they're like, uh, okay, <laughs> sod off. <laughs> but I, I thought it was beautiful characterization. And that's one of the best parts of this book. Characters, flawless. I think that this book, for all its stupidity and its pointlessness, is written gorgeously. It's one of the better written books, I think, so far of the series. It's just a shame about the lack of uh, point to this book. We then get to the, uh, the Kentucky Derby, Kentucky Derby scene, where they decide, right, we're going to sneak in looking at these horses, because they've seen... Let's just backtrack for a minute. Another pun well placed because of the tanks i don't know why i'm explaining so they they uh, they're about to fly away and they see the horses doing unhorsey things essentially and they know right something is most definitely up with these horses so the animorphs idea is to go to the national derby or the kentucky derby sorry and acquire horse morphs because i think that they think that's the best place to do it so they head down there and they fly into the stables Tobias goes to, Tobias is going to acquire a horse. He's going to finally join in the mission, which is, which is really good to see. And two guys come in and sort of say, well, what are you kids doing here? Because, you know, T Jake didn't say to Tobias, yeah, you can acquire, but just hold on, give us observation. Nope, Jake doesn't do any of that shit. Nope, he just lets Tobias fly away. So they've got no air cover. And funnily enough, because they don't have air cover, they get caught. And they see, they see Axe's ass. And they say, that's a funny looking horse. And eventually he has an off and cuts it down and they, they run. And as they're running, Cassie gets held back 
the others have disappeared and Cassie has to go into a side stable where Maximus, no, something Max, just call him Max, a horse called Max. And she acquires him to keep him calm and then morphs horse. Now remember, Cassie has two horse morphs. She has now the identical copy of that horse and she's also got a completely different horse. Why the hell is she morphing the identical horse? Again, another silly risk. What if a yerk comes along and sees two completely identical horses after hearing somebody say something about a blue horse? They're gonna add two and two together, aren't they? And think, one of those horses is probably an andalite. I'm going to keep my eyes firmly on that. Again, stupid risk. I know that th she had this whole thing about, oh, because we we're exactly the same horse, it kept him calm. But what would you rather have? The risk of putting your entire team in jeopardy or having a rather peeved horse next to you? It seems an obvious choice, doesn't it? Maybe. And then because she's morphed this identical horse, she gets involved in the race and she gets dragged out. Maybe that's why she morphed the identical horse for the plot convenience, allowing her to then run in this race. Maybe. Again, I don't like plot convenience, so I'm going to go with my original theory that she was just a being, being a bit thick. So she goes out and she wins because she's got the human mind and blah, 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 blah. And it's, it's a fun scene. It's a fun scene. I'm not going to criticise the scene. It is pointless. This scene is pointless. And just like chapter five, we'll get back to that. But not before we address risk number fucking 20 million. Cassie talks to the jockey in Thoughtspeak. <laughs> this is the worst one. She does it accidentally the first time, but then she continues to do it. Are you fucking numpty? This character is just baffling me at this point. I mean, granted, for most of this book, she's perfectly fine. You know, I got along with Cassie very well in this book. But if you're going to do something so oblivious and fucking nut jobbery, then why are you part of this fucking team? You're just going to put everything at risk. Everything. This jockey could be a yerk, for all you know. And he's going to think, right, thought speaking horse. <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> and th that's it. It's over. Done. Everything you've worked so hard for, Cassie, gone. Gone, gone, gone. Because you had to act like a total turd head. But anyway, moving on. They go to the base, they morph the horses, and they join this little herd as it heads into Zone 91. Don't know why, I'm, I do know why I'm holding this. I'm coming to it. They go into Zone 91 and they come into the secret warehouse. They charge in and the, the military personnel have, have no fucking idea what's going on. We can safely assume at this point that none of them is a yerk. Which is good. You don't want your military being yerks. Great. And they, they go in. They're like, well, why are these horses here? Don't shoot anything because you might hit something of value or, or, or of practical use. And so the horses just look at this thing that they find in this big uh, hangar. And it turns out it's this weird alien object that nobody really knows what it is, apart from Max, but he's not saying yet. Because, again, he's an idiot. So they all leave, and the Yerks look all dejected, like, oh, we've done, we've done all that effort, and we don't have a fucking clue what this thing is. You'd have thought that Visser would, you know, put some Yerks into this task who might know what they see. This thing had symbols on it. Surely there are Yerk scientists or scholars or whatever if such thing exists that would be able to read an Andalite symbol or recognise Andalite technology. Surely that is the type of Yerk you want to send down there rather than fucking bumbling fucking idiots who don't have a fucking clue what they're looking at. You might want to put somebody down there with a hint of intelligence. But whatever, they go away and Bug fighters come down. And the Vissa steps out because it's Vissa 3. And he's uh, everywhere where he shouldn't be. And he, he asks these horses who apparently have now got the capacity to speak, even though it's in Galard, the, the mouth muscles and whatever to speak. Vissa 3 offs the one who annoyed him, which is just standard Vissa 3. They don't care about their underlings. He doesn't care about his underlings. Standard. 
and uh, he is infuriated because they don't know what it is, because again, he sent the wrong fucking personnel down there. He sees the animals in Horse Morph. Cassie decides to uh, do a shite <laughs> in front of them to convince the Vista 3 convince Vista 3 that these are just normal horses and it works for all of about five seconds it turns out it was all in vain because he just said kill them anyway and they run off and Hawk Vegier chase them um, but they, they, they get so far that military personnel have got a convoy and the Hawk Vegier disappear obviously not wanting to be seen by the military so they get away and this is a uh, there's a couple of lines in these couple of pages here that I want to read to you firstly it's just an example of Axe's arrogance here. Tobias says, I can't believe the radar back at the base doesn't pick that up, referring to the bugfighter. And Axe says, radar, is that the human tool that bounces radio beams off objects? I mean, I don't mean to offend, but any Andalite child could build a radar clock from the pieces of his toys. Rachel says, somehow you are grinding my nerves, Axe, and that's supposed to be Marco's job. Yeah. It's one of those cases, again, where somebody actually steps up to Axe and says, Shut up, you twat. <laughs> I thought, again, it's a funny little, funny little character moment in there. I just want to bring up when Vissa kills the uh, horse controller who annoyed him. He shouts, Fools, idiots, incompetence. The Vissa screamed in enraged thought speak. Weeks have been wasted set... Weast ha God's sake. Weeks have been wasted setting up this effort. First, you lose that clumsy fool, Corin547, who you killed when he was bitten by a snake, and now we've lost poor Jilla 926 The Visser indicated the no longer in one piece horse controller like it had been someone else's fault he'd been lost. And I thought that was brilliant. I thought that just summed Visser 3 up perfectly. I love those few lines there. He just, it's just like, kill that bloke. Oh, look, look what you've done to poor little sod over here. <laughs> Classic Visser 3. Classic bumbling moron, but classic Visser 3 nonetheless. We get to the climax of this book, which comes totally out of left field because this whole thing has been based at a military base and then the book finishes at the gardens on a fucking House of Horrors ride. And it's such a weird change of scenery that it is a bit jarring, but I ran with it. I was still entertained, so pff, who gives a shit what I think, eh? <laughs> right. <laughs> Whilst in the military base the first time when they were being caught, uh, talked to by Captain Torelli, Cassie saw that the Yerks had a sign, not the Yerks, the military personnel had a sign up sheet to go to the gardens on this particular day. And she puts two pieces to, piece and, I can't fucking speak today. She puts the pieces together because the Visser had said, oh, we're going to resort to plan B and we'll get these guys tomorrow. And she, th she remembers the sign up sheet and thinks, so that's where the Yerks are going to ambush the going to ambush the military personnel. It does make you wonder, why would the military personnel go on a day trip to the gardens? Um, it, it, could be no, it could be completely normal, but it almost seems like there must have been a Yerk somewhere who decided to set that up as the plan B, because Visitor 3 talks about a plan B as if this was all put in place. So wouldn't there have been a Yerk in the military base to put that idea forward? and put that sign-up sheet in, or is it coincidental that Visa 3 somehow found out that this military group, who were under disguise as Gondor Industries, were going to go to the gardens? Which is it? Is it that Visa 3 somehow has fucking Elemist levels of omnipotence, or are there Yerks in the base putting this in place, in which case, why the fuck do you need the horses? Which is it? <laughs> I'm going to give myself a headache if I'm not careful, so let's just move on. Gondor Industries, which turns out to be the military lot, are in the gardens. And I like how the military personnel are seen. The bun bunch of lads, crew cuts, you know, going to the gardens having fun. Because military personnel, a lot of them are big kids at heart, really. And uh, especially, like, marines and, and ground troops. Not so much officers. <laughs> not so much officers. Definitely not. But Captain Terrell is there, he spots the kids, because Jake actually does something like a fucking leader for a change, and delegates people to places here, there and everywhere. Well, two places. Two of them, uh, three of them go to the log ride, which is where Cassie, our narrator, goes, and the other three go to the House of Horrors. So they climb into log ride, these three, 
And funnily enough, Captain Torelli is sitting behind them and he recognises Cassie and Marco. And he starts chasing them and then there's a, a log flume chase scene, which was, again, quite entertaining. And uh, then he chases them to the House of... No, he doesn't chase them to the House of Horrors. I think he just he finds them again at the House of Horrors. Because they find out that the Yerks aren't in the log flume, they must be in the House of Horrors. Because those are the only two places undercover where the Yerks can snatch people. So they join up, they go into the House of Horrors ride. Captain Torelli's in the train behind them. And they go into this part of the House of Horrors and there are, there's this weird scene. But it's awesome. Where th there are Hawpajir there. And Visitor 3 stood like statues. And then at the other side, just nearby them, there's a grizzly with a, s <laughs> a snake wrapped around her arm. And there's... Ac no, that... That's and Tobias is somewhere. Yeah, I think that's three. And they're all just stood there waiting. Because they know that Captain Torelli is there somehow. I, no, I don't know. I think the Yerks were after Captain Torelli because he's head of security. So... Jake, Marco and Cassie's thing goes by looking at this weird scene and then they jump out just before the end and just as Captain Torelli's little car is being you know, grabbed at by the Hawkbajir and they're trying to take uh, Captain Torelli. And then a little fight breaks out, there's a bit of a tussle but the Yerks escape with Captain Torelli and they start running through the gardens which, I mean... This part weirded me out because there's a big parade and hold on, who's there? So th I don't understand. The garden's right. It isn't Disney, is it? But for whatever reason, there were... You've got Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Tweety Bird, Sylvester, Tasmanian Devil and Pepe Le Pew, which as far as I know are all Disney characters, are they? I'm pretty sure they're all Disney characters. How the fuck did the gardens get the fucking rights to have those mascots. It's a completely pointless point, but this book is about being pointless. So, why, why, how did they get the rights to these characters? They would have been sued to fuck, and the gardens would be no more gone. Vista Free has this comical moment where he beheads Daffy Duck, and the person in the costume is sort of like, oh, what the fuck are you doing, mate? And this is like, what the fuck is that shit? And they, 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 he's distracted for long enough, and... They manage to rescue Captain Torelli by fighting his Hawkbajir, the Hawkbajir and Visser 3 sod off. And the bug fighters are just in plain sight because, you know, secrecy. And the, the Yerks sod off. They, they get back on their ship and they sod off. <laughs> right. So we, we've discussed in this book, or at least the characters have, that the Yerks want utter secrecy. The whole point of the Andalite toilet thing because it turned out to be a toilet, according to Axe. I think you know, I mentioned to forget that. Yeah, it was a fucking and like toilet in Zone 91. Not that that's too relevant, to be honest. The whole point, Marco thinks, that the Yerks are trying to get to this technology in Zone 91 is because they want utter secrecy. They don't want anybody even thinking that there are aliens out there, lest their plot be uncovered. And yet, Vista 3 is more than happy to have his bug fighters and Hawkbajir in plain view in the middle of the gardens. I, I, I don't get these yerks. I really fucking don't. Who... Well, Vista 3 runs it. I suppose that explains a lot. Fucking sack the shit. <laughs> but anyway, that's the book. That's the end of it. And we get the... Uh, everything sort of comes to a summation in the last chapter, as you'd probably expect. Yeah. Let's go back to... Chapter 5. Chapter 5 was pointless. What else was pointless in this book? The Andalite toilet thing, it was pretty pointless. They, dis they discuss in the last chapter how Captain Torelli should just be left to have hope that he's guarding some great secret, even though it's pointless. What I've put down for the message of this book is that sometimes you just got to do the pointless shit because it gives you cause. Even if it means fuck all, it gives you something to hold on to. And what is chapter five? Chapter five is Rachel trying to get Cassie to be trendy and hip and cool and down with the kids. Even though she is a kid. 
At first, when I first read that chapter, it's like, well, what the fuck does that, what does that give us? It gives us nothing. There's, there's no character development in there. We already know that these characters are the way they are. So why are we reestablishing this? What a complete waste of a chapter. And then I got to the end and I thought about the message of sometimes pointless shit is necessary. So I look back at chapter five and I think, that's the message it's putting across. It's it, putting across, it's, it's deliberately pointless. Deliberately. And I don't know, it fits. It fits this book. And it's appropriate. And the message itself is also appropriate. We all do pointless shit for no apparent reason. We all do. But we enjoy it. It gives us something to do. It keeps us going sometimes. It's true. And it's one of those message in life, messages in life that you don't really think about. But I think it's summed up very nicely here. Everything in this book is pointless. Cassie running the race, pointless. Rachel trying to dress Cassie up, pointless. Captain Torelli's little mission, to, pointless, pointless, pointless. But necessarily, necessarily pointless. And that's the whole point of it being pointless. And it's wonderful. I really enjoyed this book. And I, it's such a bizarre book in every sense because of this. It really is, but it's a wonderful addition. It is a wonderful addition to the Annals Collection. I'm not gonna give it fucking 10. No, 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 it's not, it's not a 10 because for all of its necessity, it's not really that necessary, if that makes sense. That doesn't make sense really, does it? There are a few stupid moments. Let's discuss Jake, because we've barely mentioned him in this book, which gives you an indication of how great his leadership was. <sighs> he did fuck all. He had no prior planning. He never really plans, does he? He's always on the spot. We go into a situation, we look at the danger around us and we think, uh, now is the time to plan. And that's not really what leaders do. You plan beforehand. But there were a couple of moments where he delegated people and he did give orders that were straightforward to follow, nice and simple, and they got the job done. So four, four out of 10, better than the last couple of books, but still not great. You've got, you've got to plan, Jake. You've got to be a bit more forceful. You've got to be a leader. You didn't, f he felt like a leader twice in this book, but the rest of it, he was just fucking invisible. So four for Jake. The book itself, I'm thinking eight. I'm thinking eight because it's it's really well written. It is really well written. One of the best written books in the series. The message is bizarre, but pretty clear and quite a useful message. And the characterization is great. Cassie is tolerable, which is, you know, not something that happens often. But it's not outstanding. It's not an outstanding book. It's not like big revelation for the series. There isn't, there aren't really moments that you remember. I mean, a lot of people will say, oh, that's the book with the horses and the toilet. But you don't really remember many of the details. So it's not an outstanding book, but nor is it a bad book in any sense. I'm gonna give this book an eight out of 10. Really quite enjoyable. And that's all I can really say about it. Next book. This one, The Escape. Marco's books have both been 10 out of 10 so far. Will this one live up to that standard? The Escape, that's next week. If you want something else to read, I do Animals Fan Fiction. This is number 55, I'm currently up to 63, making good progress on 64. That one's called The Interrogation, the links are down below. Remember, if you want to join the Animals Fitness Club, come onto the Animals Discord and just ask to be a fitness club member. And we'll get you signed up and we'll get you nice and fit for this year. How's that sound? Does that sound good? I know it sounds good. You want to do it. All right. Thank you. I forgot to turn this on. How could I forget to put on my cube? <laughs> Fuck. That was meant to be on for the whole video, by the way. It's quite flashy. It's, called, it's from Mr. Go, but you, you can do all sorts with it, really. But it's not specifically animals, but... I've got an Askerville device. How's that sound? And if I were in the TV series... Yeah, cool!
Now I've got the power to morph. And I'll tell you what I'm going to morph. I'm going to morph a fucking fitness beast. And you're going to join me on the Discord for that. So, see you all next time, I suppose. Ta-ra.